Pencil Kings, 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 Pencil Kings. If making art seems like a chore, then you're doing something wrong. All right, it's Wednesday, so we are back. This is the Pencil Kings podcast, and today we are talking to Sean Murray. And before we get Sean... To, to tell us his one minute about himself. I just wanted to read this quote on his website because I thought it was really cool. The art of Sean Murray reveals a boundless, bottomless imagination at work. He is destined to be one of the great image makers and storytellers in our field. And that's from Guillermo del Toro, who, if you're not familiar with the name, he was the director of Hellboy and a ton of other amazing uh, projects that are on my list of favorites. So, I'm excited to talk to you, Sean. Uh, you've got amazing artwork. And to start off, why don't you give people like a one minute overview of what you do just so that we can then dive into the deeper conversation? Sure. Hi, uh, I'm Sean. I guess at this point, I would call myself a freelance concept artist and illustrator. Uh, but I also uh, lately have been delving into a lot of world building for my own world that I created called Gateway. You know, I, I started my career as a concept artist in the video game industry. I've moved into doing a little bit of film and television work, um, specifically for uh, Guillermo uh, and also for um, Travis Beecham, who is the writer of Pacific Rim, and he has a new project uh, that he's working on now called The Curiosity and other various projects. Uh, but mainly my, my focus these days has been on building the the world of Gateway and creating a lot of new art for it and also some exciting new projects uh, based on the world. So that's me. Awesome. And I'm excited to dive into Gateway specifically because I know that in talking with members of the Pencil Kings community that there are a lot of people who have really big ideas of stories that they want to tell or worlds that they want to create, but I feel like they get stuck in that it, they are unable to move forward. They don't know what the first step to take is, that it's just something that exists in their head. And it's maybe, I feel like at that point, it's very nebulous. They've never, they haven't put anything to paper, even if it's with writing or whatever. And so it's just, it's stuck there. And I, I'm curious to understand the process that you went through to, to bring this out. Like, how long have you been, had you been thinking about Gateway before you actually started to do the, the hands-on work on it? Yeah, so... I believe that when it started, I was probably, I think I was in college. Um, so we're talking, you know, well, maybe almost uh, 20 years ago at this point. And uh, I remember I was on a uh, road trip with some friends and we were just kind of jamming on ideas about stuff. It was uh, one particular friend of mine who now is a script writer for movies and video games. You know, he and I were kind of playing around with some ideas, and I, I sort of struck on this idea of a fantasy world that was based more in an urban uh, setting. And I had grown up loving fantasy, you know, of all kinds, Tolkien, Dragonlance, Dungeons and Dragons, you know, Warhammer Fantasy, uh, all that stuff. Like, I, I just ate it up. And I knew at some point that I wanted to be able to create my own world like that, but I didn't know what my angle was going to be. And I've always been fascinated by cities, and and just the the excitement of cities, like the the fact that there are sort of stories uh, um, happening around every corner, and that it's just sort of this constant uh, churn of you know people d going about their daily life, but but uh, you know but there's just so many different stories. There's thousands and thousands of stories around every corner when you when you uh, when you really look closely, and so I liked the idea of having a fantasy world that was more urban based. And I also really love Star Wars, and it always kind of upset me that Star Wars and, and science fiction, they seem to be able to have these worlds where you could make up these bizarre creatures, and you could you could really just go crazy, go nuts with your creature design and, and creating all these different societies and civilizations, whereas it always felt to me that fantasy was very conservative on that in that respect. Like, you know, there were 
uh, always sort of the same thing, like dragons and elves and dwarves and gnomes and all that stuff. And while I love that stuff, I didn't feel like I had anything that I could bring to that kind of fantasy world. And so that's sort of how the whole thing kind of started. Um, and and so since that time, I was just kind of drawing things in my sketchbook, you know, sketching constantly, sort of half realizing that the stuff that I was drawing in my sketchbooks was all kind of part of that world. You know, I think before I was doing this, I was drawing a, a lot of the same kind of things that, that, you know, lots of people were drawing their sketchbooks like orcs and, you know, dudes with big axes and, you know, <laughs> and stuff like that, right? But I think it was when I realized that I could, I could create my own world that I started really following my own vision and kind of like experimenting with things that I hadn't really seen before. So... I mean, that's kind of how it started. You know, it took a long time before I realized how I was going to actually introduce the world of Gateway to everyone else. Um, and it went through a lot of starts and stops, like started writing, uh, you know, um, a script for a movie here or, you know, a script for a graphic novel there and then realizing there's no way this is going to happen. And, you know, oh, maybe I'll try to make it more like a a short novel or, you know, what, you know, like all these different things and, and nothing really stuck. But that was when, um, and then eventually, uh, and I know I'm, I'm sort of going on long about this, but um, eventually in about 2012, yeah, it was 2012, Kickstarter had only had been around for about a year. And I, I thought to myself, maybe this is the way to kind of put it out there and see if people are even interested in what I'm doing. And if so, then that would be a good excuse to, or a good reason to have something to finish. Like if I do this Kickstarter and people are, are, are into it and, it get, and it's successful, then I know that I have something to, to, to work towards and that there are people sort of waiting to see the results. And, I, and it would allow me to sort of get over a lot of that self-doubt. And so is that where you started was with Kickstarter? Like that was the big reveal to the public? It was. So when I decided I was going to do a Kickstarter, I was like, I said, I for decided first that I was going to do a Kickstarter. And then second, I, I had to figure out what exactly it was that the project was going to be. And so what I did is I sort of looked through my sketchbooks and, and through a lot of the, my personal, my, the, the sort of personal illustration work that I was doing that was all basically part of the gateway world. It just, I didn't have a, um, a theme yet. And I, I kind of looked through everything and I, and I realized there were a lot of images of what I thought of as being essentially like wizards or creatures or, or, you know, people of magic. And so I said, well, why don't I make a book that is a way of introducing the world of gateway through these characters uh, who are all part of the story of Gateway. And actually, the real, like, there was a particular image that I did, a particular piece that I did right around that, that time, that's actually the cover of the Book of Wizards, which was a result of being inspired by, in the same day I had gone to uh, the aquarium with my, you know, recently born son. Uh, he loved looking at all the fish, and it was, a, it was a good place to take him because he could, we could take him there for a couple hours, and he was, you know, really content. And we'd spent a couple hours at the aquarium looking at all the, the crazy different types of fish. And then I, we came home, and after he, we put him down to bed, I watched a Harry Potter movie. And I was thinking to myself, you know, this, is a, this movie is neat, uh, but I felt like all the wizards were just humans. And they just kind of looked like this, like, you know, normal humans with, with gray cloaks. And um, I forget what scene it was, but there were, you know, there's some scene where there were a bunch of wizards sort of hanging out, you know, in a street, like a cobblestone street. And it's just, I just, I, I thought to myself, what if there was a world where these wizards had as much variety as the fish in an aquarium? And so that's when I did the piece that's called the Defiant Five. And it sort of struck me that this, the idea is it's about these wizards who are having to practice their magic in secret because the authorities of Gateway have essentially made magic illegal. I mean, you know, um, in so much as anyone that they don't want to be practic practicing magic, it's illegal for them, but not for the people who actually run the city because, you know, as as in things, as in the way the real world works, you know, um, what's good for the goose isn't necessarily good for the gander, right? So, <laughs> so I had this idea, you know, and, it, and at first it was like, well, but that's kind of weird. It's a, it's a, 
I have this world that's very magical, but then I'm making magic illegal. Um, that's going to m- make make it harder to create content. But then it struck me that like when when we had prohibition in America, that's actually when there was it was almost like there was more drinking going on during prohibition, even though technically liquor was illegal. And we'll put that in quotes. Um, there was still a lot of drinking going on, and so that was my that was my way in to create this sort of like interesting dynamic where it's a it's gateway is full of magic. It's very magical, uh, um, and there's all kinds of amazing things happening around every uh, around every corner. But in some cases, it just has to happen sort of in the shadows or underground, or people have to be careful what they do um, when the authorities are around, right? And since it's a huge city, there's no way that like they can control everything that everybody's doing, even th- despite the fact that they may want to. Um, so that was sort of the, the basis of the story. And so then it became, all right, it's going to be a book about wizards who are involved in this sort of underground revolution. And, and as I looked through my sketchbook, I just started picking out things that I had done over the years, over, you know, more than a decade's worth of sketches um, in my sketchbooks that kind of fit into that narrative. Uh, And so I made a book dummy and I used that as the basis for uh, the video that I created for the Kickstarter. And thankfully it did very well and it allowed me to actually make the book and, and kind of set in stone a lot of the things that I had been wanting to uh, set in stone about Gateway. I just, I never had a really good excuse to do it, but then, then I had, so. I, I love, I just have this huge smile on my face because you, the story that you just told, I really pulled in, I, I pulled up the Kickstarter campaign on my phone while you were talking and I can see the image that you were talking about with the what was it called again the five or the yeah the defiant five yeah and i'm just you know i want to click the video to see what the story is behind these guys but i know i got to do this recording but what i wanted to point out was um, how you're pulling all these different influences from all these different places you pulled uh from the aquarium you know you're just like wow there's a lot of variation in these fish i wonder and then you're watching harry potter and you feel like hmm these wizards they all kind of look similar i wonder if they if there's a if we could make them all look different what that would what would happen out of that right and then talking about prohibition so you're bringing in all these different things and i think that's really um really cool and amazing and i'm not sure if a lot of people realize how many places you can draw in, inspiration from and it's not like you can force it it's i feel like it just ha- it just happens by living your life and, and being interested in the world and then figuring out how you mix all these ingredients together to come up with something that's your own you know i'm so glad that you said that because actually that's one of my main mantras um and when i when i teach or I talk to people about world building i tell them that that there, there's a couple things one is is that you're right. You have to be interested in the world around you. Uh, you know, I, I always say in order to create compelling worlds, you have to have a passion for your own world. And and that really is true because you never know where an idea is going to come from. And a lot of people kind of think that, well, people who come up with good ideas, they just sit there and things come to them, right? You know, or they think really hard and and it all just kind of like it just works like you know you just can come up with ideas by sitting there and thinking really hard but honestly it's not like that at all it's it's about kind of putting yourself out there and allowing things to kind of come at you from lots of different directions and if you're open to learning and open to sort of experiencing the world and your own personal story connections start to be made and you just you kind of never know where it's going to come from uh and it's a little scary because you know you want to think well if i can sit down and just sort of belt out this thing and get it done you know then i'll be happy but you kind of have to just trust that you know that the ideas will present themselves um and that instead of chasing uh there, there's a um, this whole idea of sort of a chasing idea versus finding an idea. And I'm much more of an advocate of finding ideas and not chasing them. Um, so I think that's a huge, hugely important um, aspect of, of world building. The other thing is that you're right. You have to allow it to 
grow on its own. You know, um, uh, again, a lot of people make this misconception. They're like, and I, I made the same mistake too. Well, in order to build a world, you have to be like Tolkien and you have to, you know, you have to write the whole backstory and you have to create all the languages and you have to make this sort of immaculate storyline and have everything just kind of figured out. Right. Like everything's got to be figured out before you can even uh, start on creating a story uh, set in your world. And that just isn't true. I didn't really have a lot. I mean, it, it was amazing to me when I actually put this Kickstarter out, how I was so worried that that I didn't that I hadn't put enough thought into the world of Gateway. Yet people would would comment to me. They're like, wow, it looks like you've put a lot of time and thought into this world that you created. And I'm like, I was thinking to myself, really? Like, like, I feel like there's so much missing and there's so many things I haven't even figured out. And you'd be amazed sometimes what something very as simple as, let's say, just making a, a, a simple map. Uh, can do to help your world come alive or create an image of an important character uh, or an image of an important location. And it's almost as if people's imaginations start you know, from there and they can almost fill in what's, what, what's going on outside of that image. And it's still your world because you gave them the, the, the starting point, but you didn't have to necessarily figure out every single nook and cranny um, uh, for the viewer or the reader. Yeah, and I'll definitely echo that because I was looking at that map and just like, wow, what, I wonder what happens here. Like what what's going on over in this place? And there's so many – I didn't count them, but I feel like there's at least 200 locations that are named yeah. on the map. Plus all the unnamed places, and right. the names are are they're ver they're, there's quite a bit of variation in the names, but through some of them you can you can just feel like oh, there's a story behind that name. I know there is. That's an awesome name. Right, right. Well, and and also you know it comes from as a kid I was fascinated with maps. I would study and pore over maps, and and you know and you know just it's crazy how like a little dot on a piece of paper with you know three roads leading into it, and you know. I don't know, a swamp, you know, nearby or whatever just makes you think, well, wow, what's going on there? Like, who lives there? What are they doing? You know, it seems kind of remote, you know, uh, you know, how many people live there? What, what, are, what kind of jobs are there? You know, you know, like, it's, it's so weird how our imagination does that. But, but that's kind of exactly what I wanted uh, people to get out of uh, this world. I want people to see all these hints at what's beyond um, and, and kind of fill it in for themselves. And, and that's why also I, I wanted there are certain aspects to this world, to Gateway, that I want to be familiar to people, um, you know, and because, so for instance, on the map of Gateway, let's say as an example, I, I chose to name the different neighborhoods and the different like sections of the city, things like, like Swamp Town, Harbor Town, uh, you know, Forest Town, Prison City, Crystal City, all these things, right? Which... You know, you could say, well, that that's kind of strange. Why didn't they, you know? Why don't they have names that are based on like people's last names or whatever? And and I actually, you know, if you read through it, um, one of the things I mentioned is that there are actually other names for all of these different parts of Gateway. It's just that, that the if I was to just come up with all these sort of random fantasy names, um, that there would be no necessarily there wouldn't be a, as much of a connection to it. And, and it wouldn't immediately bring something to, to, to people's minds. And so it was very purposeful on my part that um, in, naming, in, in the naming conventions that I came up with for naming the different neighborhoods of Gateway because I wanted people to have an immediate image uh, in their mind or, or immediately be able to think about like, ooh, I really want to know what, you know, Canal City is like. Like that, that seems really neat to me because, uh, you know, I love Venice or whatever. And, and, and I wonder if it's anything like that, you know. So – so that was a very I, I did that on purpose for that for that very reason. Um, and and I think, you know, sort of going forward, like like I'm going to expand upon the map. I'm going to expand upon a lot of things, um, but I didn't want to get too into like the details yet. I want people to just kind of let it sort of percolate and, and get people thinking about these things themselves, you know. Yeah, I just the two that I'm excited to, to learn about are Butcher's Flats, which I'm, yeah, there's just so many things you could do with that, uh, and then Stonecutter City. I'm wondering if you're going to slip a Simpsons reference in there or two. Uh, so, who knows? Yeah. 
you know, but just just going off the names, things that I'm excited about, and I I like what you said about being very conscious about the naming so that people can identify with it. And I see that you know for what we do, a lot of the times we try to make things really obvious, like with Pencil Kings, so that when people see it, like, oh, I know what that is, versus naming it like, you know, the the diamond the diamond cut course. It's like, what? Right. It just, you know, it just yeah. doesn't make any connection with when you're trying to learn how to draw. Right. So I, I guess then for, for my understanding is, is that it just, it's this very organic process. And for somebody who wants to, they've got an idea in their head. It's just to start anywhere, exactly. start putting things down and just, you don't have to force yourself because it might happen that, you know, for three months you've got a extra time and you're putting a bit more time into it, but you're just letting it happen organically and, and over time because when it's something as big as creating a world or an IP or something like that, that it's, it's, I'm sure that there are people who can just sit down and, and make this happen. But, uh, for the reality of where most people are at, you know, with a nine to five job or, or, and they're doing this on the side, it's just, let it just let it happen and i feel like enjoying the process is another big part of it because it's it feels like it, you're enjoying it you know exploring these different characters that you're creating and uh figuring out how you're pulling things from the real world and working those into the storyline oh absolutely listen if you feel like it's a it's a chore to be doing the the world building then you then you've started off wrong right like you know that that's also the reason why i think when you're when you're building a world it has to be personal it has to be something that comes from within you, uh, and you know whether it's something that you feel is missing uh, in in a particular genre, or something that you always enjoyed doing as a kid. You know, a game that you liked to play as a kid, and you thought to yourself, "Man, if there was a whole world based on this idea, this concept, like that's that is the best kind of uh, world building to do." And and when I've taught, so I taught a couple times. I taught this. Um, online world building workshop and uh, I'm, I'm going to do it again at some point it's just I haven't really been able to have the time to do it um, but one of the things that would happen is I would have students they would they would present their idea to me and they would say well then there's these dwarves and they live underground and you know they're you know they, they've got a horde of you know jewels and they're digging too deep and blah 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 and I'd, I'd always say stop stop wait you know Tell me, explain to me why you think you have to have dwarves in this story. Like, is there a reason or is it because you feel that every fantasy world, that if you're going to make a fantasy world, that it has to have dwarves and it has to have elves because there's some sort of unwritten rule about that? And oftentimes, you know, once I would start digging, I would realize that that was the case, that that, that they thought, well, it's the fantasy world, so it's got to have all these things. And, and I would sort of try to make them step back and really analyze what what part of the story or that they were trying to tell was was served by having dwarves or gnomes or whatever right if if there is and, and instead of thinking about it as well it's dwarves fantasy worlds have dwarves are going to have dwarves what's the archetype that you're that you're trying to um, that you're trying to you know use or what's what is the essentially like yeah, right. The, the the story basis for for these types of characters, and do they serve the story? Do they serve the idea that you have in your mind? And and you know, when it came to Tolkien, I mean, he created that world not because he was like, okay, I'm going to create a fantasy world now, um, and it's going to have all these things. It was because it, it was inspired by his life and, and, and things that had happened to him in his life and things that he was interested in languages, right? And it was in, influenced by his time in, in World War One in the trenches and and uh, and his love of mythology, but but his feeling uh, that that England didn't have a robust mythology of its own. So he wanted to create one for, you know, the country that he loved and he grew up in and loved. And so it, and so when you see that and you realize that there were personal reasons that, that he was doing this. That's when you have to sort of check yourself when you're creating your world and say, am I doing this for me or am I doing this because this is what people expect? Yeah, I like that. And it's I've seen the same thing, too, with people. And um, I don't know. I feel like we could talk about this all day. But True. Um, <laughs> um, I'm I'm curious about some of the work that you're doing with uh, one fantastic workshop, uh, one fantastic week. There's a couple different names that's going by, but you're teaching uh, the stuff that you're 
I feel like you're discovering this because there's things that you can learn uh, from other people, but just in talking with you now, I realize that your process is more of like incorporating a bunch of different things, mixing them together, and then this is this is how Sean does right. it. Right. Well, okay. So the 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 workshop it's called the Fantastic Workshop now. Last last time we did it, this is only uh, it's it's in November. We did the first one last last November last year, um, and it's all tied to a um, uh, video podcast called One Fantastic Week by um, Pete Morbacher and Sam Flegel, uh, both of whom are il- illustrators. And the focus of the um, of One Fantastic Week and the workshop is on how do you make a career, a, uh, an entrepreneurial career out of illustration? Like, And in some ways, it's, it's almost about sort of figuring out a way to get people uh, to start moving towards or moving away from client work and towards creating their own content, creating their own, you know, um, business model where they can create their, their, you know, personal work and, and actually make money off of it or, you know, or make a living off of it. Right. And, um, so the workshop is basically, uh, it's a, it's a four day weekend we spend in Nashville and we, in, in, in with a lot of these other workshops, the the premise is always come and do work and we'll show you how we do things and maybe that will influence you and and give you some ideas for how to make your work better right but the premise of this workshop is really show us what you do and what you love to do and we can maybe help you figure out how to make that um into like a successful for lack of a better term business model Right. And focus on like getting the you as an artist to a place where, you know, you can sustain yourself because we live in a really exciting time now where that where it's becoming more and more possible to do these things. I mean, with you don't need, you know, um, a, a big publishing company to sell your illustrated book to millions of people anymore to in order to make ends meet. I mean, you know, in, in a lot of cases, in, in some ways, you only need a few thousand people who are willing to pay, you know, a hundred or two hundred or three hundred dollars a year for whatever it is that you do in order to make a, a, a decent living. And, you know, a few thousand people is not that much. Um, and so, you know, we're trying to help and encourage artists to find their path. And and I think it's a really exciting thing. And the workshop itself, there's a lot of instructors, um, myself included, um, and and we kind of you know we talk to you about about how we got there um, or are getting there. Um, but we want you as the student to kind of show us what you're really excited about doing and what's personal um, uh, to you. And and it is very personal. And and the, when we did the workshop, there were some times where you know, it was, uh, it got kind of intense because, you know, um, we sort of recognized that, that a student was maybe doing this work because they felt they had to, because it fit into a, you know, particular niche, um, that, uh, they, that, you know, that they've seen as successful elsewhere. And then we'd look through their sketchbooks or something and, or, or we'd see them do this other drawing and we go, what about that? And, and they'd be like, well, but that's just this thing. It's kind of weird. I don't know if it'll really work. You know, and and we have to say, no, look, that's actually the really good work that you're doing. Like, that's the stuff that's exciting. And and actually, that happened to me, too. I remember um, years ago, I was at San Diego Comic-Con, and I brought my por- portfolio to show around. And actually, I had brought two portfolios. One portfolio was all the work that I was doing sort of professionally and stuff that I felt would get me work with clients, like, you know, doing role-playing game books or whatever, right? And it had a lot of things that that, that I, I had figured people expected to see um, so that they knew what they could get out of me. And then the other portfolio was all my personal work that I was doing essentially for Gateway. And I, I'll never forget, I don't remember who it was, but um, an art director of the video game company was sort of looking through these portfolios and he said, you know, this first one's good, but this second one is this other one. I can tell this is the one that you're really where you're really passionate about the work that you're doing, and I'm much more excited about that. He said, "I don't know where it goes or what it's for, but it's much more compelling work," and and that was a real sort of wake up call uh, to me. And so 
you know, that's sort of the intention, I think, behind the, um, the workshop uh, is to give people those sort of like moments of like, yeah, you know, I really should embrace this, this stuff that I'm doing for myself. I really like that and recently I've been doing a lot of calls with uh, members looking at some of their portfolios. I, what you said is exactly right, that there's things that you're doing as an artist or an illustrator or creative that you can't, it's difficult to see the greatness that you, you possess inside of yourself sometimes. And when somebody who's a little bit further down the path, they can look at it and just immediately pick up on it you know yep. like it just screams out to you like this piece like your whole portfolio t it's it's okay like you did good work i don't want to crush anyone's right, dreams right. but put that aside and go down this vein and uh, do a few more pieces and then i want to introduce you to this person because i think they're going to love what you're doing and th that just starts on this great path yep. and i i made the same mistake um, when I was younger, having a portfolio filled with all sorts of different things. And, um, you know, it, it didn't go very far. And I, because I feel like it's, I don't know if everyone goes through this. And I, it must be. It must be like the 80 20. 80% 80 of people do their portfolios the, you know, the quote unquote, the wrong way, but it's like a stepping stone. Yeah. And then having that expert or more experienced person to be able to come and look over your shoulder and help you hone that a little bit, what you already have going on, super powerful. It is. And, and, and here's another way of looking at it too. And, you know, maybe a bit, uh, grandiose, but, but each one of us is an individual with our own unique worldview. And, and the idea that you would deny the rest of the world something that is uniquely you that that we haven't seen before in favor of something that we see all the time um it's it's almost in a way uh, um as an artist i would say kind of irresponsible right because it's like you have these things within you that i think there is a niche for and it may be scary this, this idea of putting those things out there because it really is like taking your insides and putting them out and and that's hard for uh, for artists especially because we're we're all you know mostly uh, introverts by trade but honestly it's the it's almost like thinking you have to think about it as it's the right thing to do and it may be difficult at first and you may run up against a lot of objection or, or a lot of people going I don't what is this I don't understand it but ultimately it makes the world better because th there there is there are more ideas out there there's there's more art there's more beauty out there and and as opposed to just kind of more of the same uh but with like maybe just a tiny little twist or maybe even not even as good right i mean like you know it's like oh i'm doing shiny robots because i know that shiny robots will get me work um but are your shiny robots better than like the best dudes out there doing shiny robots? You know, and if not, then what's the purpose, right? And what is it that you're doing? Why? It's almost like seems like you're wasting your time if you're not able to be better than the other guys making shiny robots, you know? Totally. Well, we are at about time here. So do you have any last words uh, before we wrap up? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just basically what we've been saying. You know, you have to have fun. You know, if, if making art seems like a chore, then you're doing something wrong. And for me, it's always been about exploring this world. It just took a while to realize what the world was that I was creating. And I think it's just about trusting your own vision, trusting your own ideas, and, and being okay with those ideas being different uh, or maybe, you know, weird or quirky, you know, like the, the, there's nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, uh, there is an audience for you out there. It, it just may take a little while to find that audience, um, but it's worth, it's worth the work and the time and the effort. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's, that's really what I have to say about the whole thing. Well, thank you so much, Sean. I think there's a ton of golden nuggets throughout this call. Um, I want to send people to go to cityofgateway.com where you can sign up for updates um, to this amazing world that Sean's building out. I think he's got some top secret projects in the works, so you'll be uh, the first to hear about those when they get released. And also, 
I want to get this link right. It is at, if you're interested in learning with Sean in November, it's at one, uh, as in the number one, fantasticweek.com. Um, and you can see, I, there's a there's a bunch of instructors there together with yes, you, correct? Absolutely. Yeah, there's a big, big group of us. Yeah, so if you if you feel like you're if if what we were just talking about really resonated with you, that you feel like there you have something but you're not sure what it is, you know, you've been working really hard and you, you're you're looking for that break, these people can really help leapfrog you from where you're at because they'll see things that you can't. Um, you know, if you're hanging out with other people who are, you know, your peers, sometimes your peers can't see that too, because they're your peers. You need somebody who's a little bit more experienced. So I think it sounds like an amazing opportunity to go and not only have somebody help direct you a little bit, but also just the networking possibility that you're, you're going to be meeting people that are highly connected, uh, with all kinds of opportunities and, and friendship. And, and so that sounds amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, if I can just quickly, the, the, the list of artists, um, it's myself, uh, Peter Moorbacher, Sam Flegel, Kelly McKernan, uh, Vanessa and Ron Lemon, uh, Stephanie Law and Jasmine Beckett Griffith. And then there will be some other uh, guest um, artists showing up for like um, talks and stuff. So Awesome. How many people went to the, the last one that you did? Uh, How many students uh, were there uh, or, or yeah, participants? Sure. I think it was about, um, I want to say it was like 15 to 20. Uh, somewhere in that range. So it's not awesome. a huge group, but that, but that allows us to give people yeah, really one on one to time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Sean. Uh, we will have, as usual, show notes for this at pencilkings.com slash podcast. So if you don't want to type out those links or whatever, you can go there and, and we'll have them for you as usual, as well as uh, some of the, the gold nuggets that we unearthed in this episode. So thank you very much. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. Ah, you talk like a fool. I would trade a century of practice for an ounce of inspiration.